Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming in Elden Ring and the Things You Didn't Know series. We're up to 24 episodes in this series and today I'm quite excited because I have quite a few things that I've learned from just doing builds and different discussion and news videos. So while this episode isn't full of things, you guys let me know in the comments this time. Thank you so much for all your comments and advice and things to put in this series. I'm sure I'll be including a lot of them in the next episode. But for now, let's begin this one. To kick us off then, we have some interesting ones to do with the grab attacks, which have been buffed in patch 1.07. So take Inescapable Frenzy here, it's just more effective. Or Lifesteal Fist, which is also improved in the same ways. It's faster, it's got better range, you've got better recovery, you're more likely to hit these. So we were thinking, okay, well maybe we should do a build with grab attacks since they're better. And how would we make that work? Well, the first thing that jumped to our mind was sleep. In PvP or PvE, you can put enemies to sleep. And even if they're resistant to it, like in PvP, they'll stagger for a moment and they'll be vulnerable. That's always enough time to land an Ash of War. With these new improvements to the speed at which they come out, then now you can guarantee grab attacks. Well, the thing you didn't know in this episode for this topic is sadly that doesn't work. It is impossible, in fact not allowed, to grab someone when they are currently sleeping, even if it's the short stagger one like you see in PvP or in scenarios in PvE where you're against a resistant enemy. Yeah, really disappointing, right? Like the fact they finally made these grab attacks better and we have a way to absolutely secure them now, finally making them really threatening, doesn't work. It's a sad one, but it's an important one to know. Speaking of grab attacks in general then, Inescapable Frenzy, which has had quite a lot of changes to it over time. Obviously in patch 1.07, this has been buffed, so it's cheaper on the FP, you got better recovery time, and also the grapple range was improved. So this is actually something you can use. And I started to see in PVP going against a Frenzy build with this as sort of the core of the build, actually in my last build video. Very cool to see, but it's important you understand how this works if you're considering trying it. It's just interesting in general. You see, how it used to work is based entirely on what weapon is in your main hand or your right hand. So in the case of the cane sword here and the miscorde here, these two uh, weapons, we have critical 100 and we have critical 140. So based on the calculation, say I'm holding this dagger, I would have deal, I would have dealt more damage using the dagger just because its critical number is higher. Seals also come with that, but they're all at 100 as a default. So let's say I had my seal in my main hand, then it would use the seals critical and that would also be 100 so not a great option so previously the best way to get the most damage out of these grabs was by having a high critical weapon in your main hand like this dagger that has changed now what you're going to need is sort of unconditional buffs to improve the damage of that frenzy so fire damage improvements are obviously going to be great for this such as the fire scorpion charm here or if you're full health the ritual sword talisman or interestingly the flox canvas or faithful canvas these raise the potency of incantations so of course they're going to work on this incantation it's important to understand how this works if you're planning on trying grab attacks and specifically in escape or frenzy because that's been made quite relevant and fun to use but you might have been operating on the old information so i figured it was worth talking about in this series for sure. So here's an example of how it used to work not being the case anymore. We have a weapon with 100 critical here, so the default. We've got the grab off and it's going to do 379 damage. Let's try again. We got the grab off this time with the dagger in the main hand, so that would have done way more damage previously. Now it's doing the same, 379. We're back again this time with those talismans equipped. They're going to increase our damage. There we go. Nice hit. And we've got 403. Now this is completely unupgraded, this is not a build for it, but it's a clear roughly 15% damage increase with just a few talismans there just to get you going. But there are many ways to increase your fire damage or incantation damage, so that's the way you want to do it now. Okay, grab attacks aside now, let's talk about a little interesting one that Josh was telling me about. As it turns out, there are a few of these strange large dog creatures around the world, but there's only one of them in the entire game that seems to wear a collar and is under a character's control. Gowry and his shack there is tied to the Millicent storyline, very important character, bit of a creepy one. But somehow he's got some kind of control over the beasts of this land. Obviously a very powerful character. The fact that it's got a wrapping spiked collar doesn't look too comfortable. I mean, that dog don't look comfortable in general, but I've never stopped to look at it. I've always stopped and gone, okay, well, that must be his dog for some reason. The way it's sitting there 
there is very strange, but I've never looked at the details. This reminds me of Radigan's pet dog, or the wolf of Radagon that you fight in the in the academy itself. We featured that in the series where, yeah, it's got a little baubles and necklace and trinkets to indicate that it's more than just a wolf, like a guard dog per se, but something that's respected and loved. I don't know if this dog's all that respected and loved, but it's cool to see these subtle details to indicate that there is some companionship, there is a relationship between these two characters. It's not a coincidence that it's sat there. Next, there's something I want to talk about in this series. We're going to talk about two things that I've mentioned in some news videos that I've covered, but something that should be in this series for certain. Two major aspects of the potential DLC that we're hoping gets announced at the Game Awards on December 8th. Very recently, a data miner and great content creator for Elden Ring, Sekiro Dubi, actually found a couple things. Firstly, the fact that there are now 30 flags, aka slots, for boss fights in the game completely unused. Newly added to the files of the game, that indicates an addition, right? And surely that would lead to DLC. If you don't know what you're actually looking at, these are like the old flags, right? Some of the old flags. Slots for the boss fights and their rewards. So the one at the top here, we have Margit. When you defeat Margit at the beginning of the game, you get that pouch and that increases how many talisman slots you have. So the first boss, the first major boss of the game, Margit, and the reward associated with it. Under that, we have, of course, Godric, and you're gonna get the Remembrance and and also the Great Rune. So of course, those are marked there with the information next to them. Not all of these are used. There is one that's unused in Stormvale, like a boss that's supposed to be at the back or hidden away somewhere that they ended up never using, like cut content, or just another one that's under the Elden Beast itself, maybe an extra boss that was just never used towards the end, maybe like a side second ending, another unused boss fight. So the fact that there's 30 slots for this potential DLC does not necessarily mean there's going to be 30 bosses in the DLC, but it does give us a marker, a close marker of what to expect. I would say 25 being a lowball reasonable estimate, but 30 doesn't seem unheard of. It's a big topic, like how big is the DLC actually going to be? As I mentioned in a recent video, it's debatable how many bosses are actually in Elden Ring. It's obviously a tough topic when we're talking about how many bosses were reused. Say you fight a boss earlier in the game and then you fight the exact same boss, but now there's two of them. Do you count that as a unique boss fight and therefore goes to the tally? Communally, around 160 to 165 people seem to agree on that number though. So 30 is about one sixth of that number. So the DLC size could be about one sixth of the entire size of OG Elden Ring, which would make sense. It would mean it's about the size of, say, Limgrave in its full, or the lakes, or any of the major regions. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's only going to be one area. It could be like, say, the underground sections. It could be three different areas connecting to each other in different ways, but amassing to kind of the size of one of the major regions of the original game. It's cool that we can make these estimates, and a huge thank you to Sekiro Dubi for talking about this so that we can discuss it. Hopefully, though, we won't have to speculate for long because, again, I do think we're going to get that announcement on December 8th. Further to that, though, we have some more information, again, tied to Doobie. With patch 1.07, yeah, there was a lot added to the game, obviously, like the updates to the Ashes of War, incantations, and so on, the meta things, things we're enjoying right now. But as with the source of the 30 boss slots, other things have been added into the files, perhaps less obvious ones, but very interesting ones, such as new map files, such as a new legacy map file that's being unused, and new arena map files, which seems to suggest that these three arenas around the world that are being unused currently that are fleshed out like if you go in them they're very fleshed out the stands there's lifts there's areas to go through corridors waiting areas and the actual arena itself obviously completely unused and there from the beginning we've always seen them also in the files from the beginning was a sort of leaderboard sort of rank up system for different factions or covenants within that we always wondered whether that was meant to be like an unused pvp rank up system that would unlock different rewards as you won more jewels in this match made PvP that could come to the game. Well, Sekiro Dubi, an awesome creator here on YouTube, had found some interesting details within the files and sort of recreated it. You know those banners that pop up when you do something, like say you have defeated the boss or you've died? Well, newly added in this patch are four new banners that do not currently work, but maybe will soon. Match begin, you win, you lose, or even draw. So between these unused banners, the arena map files that exist, I'm thinking that we're either getting a DLC that's definitely gonna include match made PVP using these arenas at last, 
or maybe we'll have a smaller content update that's free sooner, hopefully, that just includes match made PvP. Add some covenants to actually join and then improve and work towards rewards based on your standing in that covenant through match made PvP. It's an exciting time and hopefully a very good thing for the PvP of Elden Ring. Okay, next comes a recent discovery when I was playing PvP and I was working on a build and I came across this really cool build where they became completely untargetable. I could not auto lock onto them, meaning all I could do was fight them using free aim and it was very difficult to win. I thought it was a really cool build and wanted to look into it myself and try it, maybe make some adaptations to the build. And that's exactly what we did. We've got a whole video on it now. But once again, it's another thing that deserves to be in this series because it's quite a unique and interesting thing. So so there's these two ways to go semi-invisible, right? You've got Assassin's Gambit, which is an Ash of War. I've got it on this dagger, bit of health, bit of FP, and now I'm see-through and I don't make sound and I can run around and yeah, it's like semi-invisibility. But then there's also the spell, Unseen Form, which does the similar thing. I do it, I go semi-invisible, I'm like see-through. You can use either one of these in PvE to bypass some tough areas. As you can see, I'm sort of stealthing through some tougher sections of the Halig tree here using it. And honestly, it's very useful, especially early game as well when you're low level. However, it's the combination of the two that's causing the untargetable nature in PvP specifically. So by applying Gambit and then the Unseen Form, Together, it seems to be so much stealth that like a level goes too high and then players can't actually auto lock onto you, forcing them to just free aim and try to hit you in an unexpected way. It's interesting in PvP because you see some people who are like, oh, I see what you're doing, that's neat. Let me see how I can deal with that. And they work out good options, jumping attacks, running attacks. If they have free aim spells or incantations, those worked well too. And some people try to wait out. Of course, that's not really an option because it takes only a moment to actually apply. And then on top of that, it lasts 30 seconds each. So I can kind of maintain this the whole time. It's not expensive on the FP. Some people don't like that and just quit out because they just refuse to engage with something that's not normal, I guess. But it's interesting because say spellcasters, their spells can't lock onto anything because the player can't lock onto you. So they just go shooting off into nothing once you have these two buffs applied. Another interesting detail to do with, say, Assassin's Gambit is the fact that when you've got it applied, you aren't making any sound, right? So you can full sprint around without making any sound. As long as the enemy, say, in PvE, you're running for an area, they don't have line of sight on you, you can run right behind them full sprint. You don't have to be crouched and stealth. Or another cool detail is the fact that you can make torrent invisible and be able to do these same things using unseen form. If you have the staff in your main hand, you can cast spells right. So I can do unseen form from Torrent's back and now he too is invisible and see-through making no sound to the enemy so I can full sprint around and run past enemies as long as I'm behind them and they won't ever notice me which could be pretty useful. If nothing else it's cool and interesting the way that I'm see-through like this and definitely worth talking about in this series I think. Finally as a follow-up to an interesting one we've been looking at in this series you can use healing or productive spells to damage revenants who are kind of like these unholy creatures. So take even a basic heal. You can do a burst of damage and it'll even instantly stagger them, leading to a critical hit if you're quick enough or just a free kill in other cases. They're really annoying enemies to deal with, so having something as simple heal that most players are going to be able to use on builds as a hard counter to one of the most annoying enemies in the game, that's great and something we've talked about before. But I was wondering, what about the blessings of the Erd Tree? It's sort of a buff that heals you over time. Would that work the same against Revenants? Would it be essentially a very powerful dot, like damage over time? How long would it last? Would a single use be enough to kill it? As it turns out, yeah, Blessings of the Erd Tree does in fact work that way. It functions as, as for you a heal over time, but to an enemy like this, a damage over time, and it just continues to go. And it lasts ages. It did over 1,500 damage to this Revenant from 100 health, 100% health, to zero in one single very effective and easy to cast cast. Further highlighting the fact that if you are playing a faith build in any way, and you've got enough faith to say use Blessings of Erd Tree or basic heals, you absolutely should be using them in a PvE playthrough. My question is, Will they do in the DLC more unholy enemies of this nature? Will we get to use more healing spells as an offensive tool? It is a very cool thing, but there aren't many enemies in this game that are vulnerable to it. So more of that could be useful, and knowing how it works, hopefully will be relevant.
But there you have it. Another things you didn't know in Elden Ring video. Hope you enjoyed this one. It was nice for me to rarely get to just fill it with things that I've been learning myself rather than a communal effort. I never thought this series would get this far, but it's very cool it's lasted so long. And I think I could just keep going for a little while still. So as always, if there's anything unique and interesting that you've not seen in this series so far that you think should be discussed, then let me know in the comments and I'll give you a shout out when I do. For now though, I've been Hollow. You've been you. Thanks so much for watching. And we'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos. Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes. Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice. To reiterate that it is nice. To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world our stage. Is, uh, goodbye.